If Ironman training and racing is not challenging you anymore, then today's episode is for you. Katie and I dive into the world of Ultraman. We talk about what her training looked like over this three-day race. We talk about some of the lessons that she learned in this process. And by the way, she was second female and only minutes separated her from first place over this multi-day race. So she's got a thing or two to teach us about this crazy three-day race distance. Hope you enjoy the episode. Solo, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah, so looking forward to this conversation today. I don't I think you might be the first Ultraman I've ever spoken to in my life. Well, that's exciting. I uh, I hope I live up to the hype. <laughs> Well, I'm excited to dive into the sport with you um, and not only just the the race itself, but your training that you did leading up to it. Um, but before we do that, can you kind of give our listeners a little background of, of who you are and what your story is? Yeah, so um, I've been a triathlete for about six years. I've done three Ironmans, I think about nine 70.3s, and I just got to a point where I wanted to see what else I could do. Um, so I took on Ultraman. Um, I've had several foot surgeries that led me to the lever and, um, yeah, so my next, my next adventure was Ultraman and that's what I'm recovering from right now. Awesome. Yeah, no. And you just did it, uh, about a month ago, so it's Mm -hmm. still pretty fresh, fresh on your mind. Has your body recovered officially? Uh, I believe so. This is the first, um, week that I've seen a little bit of intensity in my schedule. Everything's been very low key, very what you feel like doing. Um, don't push the envelope, just let your body come back to baseline before we start pushing again. Yeah. And that makes sense. We have a question that we dive into, um, most podcasts before we get started. And I'm really interested to kind of hear your response on it. But the question is like, what's the why behind why you run? Um, and we can talk about triathlons here in, in your case, but I would love to, you know, obviously le- learn a little bit from you around like, what is the why behind why you do this awesome, but sometimes crazy sport? Um, I think my why is always fluctuating. Um, I got into this sport, just the allure of fitness itself. And then I was like, oh, I wonder what it looks like to do all three together. And so I fell face first into triathlon. And my why has been geared towards achieving bigger and greater things for me. So whether that was a world championship or a PR and like every day roll out of bed and it's like, I want to be faster, better, stronger. That's my ultimate goal. Um, Going into Ultraman, it was making it to the start line healthy, improving Mm -hmm. myself that I could do big things healthy. Um, and I did that and I succeeded. Um, but my why changed throughout the route, uh, the training of this race. Um, I got into running and pushing the limit with my dog. Um, and I lost her in January and that was really tough. Um, and anytime things would get tough, I would always resort to, we'd go for a run and it was just, that was my therapy. Um, in gearing up for this race when I lost her, I knew I couldn't just like go run those fields out. And so day three run day was, I just wanted to run and not quit like for her. And so that was my why during the race. Yeah. Um, well, first off, sorry to hear that. It's very difficult, um, to lose a pet, especially if one that's like family. So I'm sorry to hear that. Um, but also, yeah, thank you for sharing, you know, the, the why behind that ra- the race as well. Um, yeah, definitely sounds like it gave, she gave you the strength to, to carry on that third day, 52 miles. Um, well, yeah, thank you for sharing that. So as you kind of prepared, like you mentioned earlier here on the call, um, you know, you've been in the, the sport of triathlon for a bit now, a handful of years. Uh, you're also the the owner founder of Mind Over Matter. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So my husband and I, we both own Mind Over Matter. Um, we actually bought it from a friend of ours. My husband helped found it with our friend, um, but we took over full responsibility in 2020. Um, we have a decent sized uh, endurance team of athletes. Um, There's about 225 of us all over the U.S. and Canada. 
Um, and then we also have apparel and it keeps us pretty busy. Hmm, I bet. <laughs> yeah. So you run a company, um, training for a crazy race like Ultraman. Um, but you know, before we get into Ultraman, so we first met, um, I guess a handful of months ago, uh, six months or so ago. Um, and we were kind of, you were coming off of, you're coming off of Ironman, Texas, uh, where you were building up into Ironman, Texas after, I believe it was a surgery? Second foot surgery, yeah. Your second foot surgery. Um, and then, you know, you went through Ironman, Texas, you did Kona, and then you were getting ready for, you were getting ready for Ultraman here in February. Um, can you kind of walk us through your last year? I mean, that's two big Iron, two big Ironmans, one Ultraman. Yeah, I guess walk us through this last year and and what that's looked like. Yeah. So going into Ironman Texas 2023, I was recovering from a second foot surgery from a tendon repair and a screw removal. Um, and I used the lever for nearly all of my training and had an extremely successful Ironman Texas, um, where I ran my fastest marathon to date, um, and qualified for Kona. So from there I expected to build into Kona, gain all this fitness. And then I was like, cool. Once I have that fitness, we're just going to double it. And I'll go into Ultraman like crazy prepared. And that is not what happened at all. Um, I think going into Kona, I was overzealous and kind of hit a wall and um, got really tired. And so going into Kona, I wasn't in the best of anything at that point. Um, and I took October off pretty much completely. Um, but going into Kona, I was putting in high volume weeks. I was putting in 23 plus hour weeks, um, of swim, bike, run training. And so I knew I had fitness. I just was too tired to access it. Um, and so I took all of October off and started in November and with a different coach and a different, um, strategy of, what I look back now as being an incredibly smart strategy at the time we butted heads and it was a really tough, like, no, you're still not going easy enough to recover. You're still not getting to that point, um, of being healthy again. And so, um, I went from my most run volume over the summer being 105 miles in a month to the most I did to go into Ultraman was 89 miles. Um, and I went and ran 52 miles <laughs> on race day. Um, the training looked drastically different. It was all zone one. It was a lower zone one than what I had seen before. Um, and it was basically an extended taper to allow me to access the fitness and have a smoother race, um, and to build on kind of what I had the, idea of gaining more fitness or doubling what I had from Kona was just kind of an illogical thought. And I learned that very quickly. Um, yeah. but yeah, it was, it was an interesting year and it was a lot of bucket list items that just happened to fall all together. And it was an incredible ride. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was definitely an incredible ride. And, and looking back, I think it's been, it's really cool to actually, and you sent me some of your uh, data too, which is awesome, but like to see the results backed up by the data. And, you know, I feel like we kind of kicked off the conversation when we first met, because you asked me a question around like, do, I think it was something like, do people typically train like a high percentage of their volume on lever? And you know, I, we've seen that before, um, certainly, but we've always thought like the, the right mix was, you know, 10, 20% of your weekly volume on lever, like the rest of it outside. Um, but for you, that wasn't really an option at the time leading up to Ironman Texas, because you were coming back from this foot surgery. And if I rem remember correctly, I think you said you did like 95% of your volume on lever, like leading up into Ironman Texas. Yes. I did. I only had like two runs outside and they were split between the lever. Like my long run was split between half on the lever and half outside, um, prior to Ironman Texas. Yeah. And then, and you said like body felt good. You obviously had a great race qualified for Kona. 
And then because you were, you know, quote unquote healthy, a, a lot of that transitioned to outdoor run mileage throughout the summer and then leading up into Kona. Um, and then we spoke, I think it was right after Kona where, you know, I guess, what were some of the lessons learned from that Ironman Texas training for you specifically? And again, I'm not saying this is, this is the right type of training for everybody, but what did you learn for you specifically from the Ironman Texas training to like what you did with Kona? And, um, I know you already alluded to some of the fatigue and the breakdown that you had before Kona, but I guess, could you walk us through some of the lessons that you learned in that training? Yeah, absolutely. So comparatively to Ironman Texas training to Kona training, I didn't, I don't think I touched the lever at all during Kona training. Um, and that showed um, the fatigue definitely crept in and I didn't realize it until it was too late. And I strongly believe like if I had relied more on the lever to reduce the body weight, to allow me to recover, to not have the fatigue I was carrying from those long runs, it would have made a huge difference. Um, I went into both Ironman Texas that I've done using the lever and both of those were significantly better performances than what happened in Kona for me. Um, and it was just simply building strength. Your body learns to hold a higher and stronger cadence when you don't have that body weight and it's not spiking your heart rate and you learn to adapt to that pace and what that muscular feel is. And you just, you're able to fall into that pace outside more naturally and it transitions really well. So for me, the biggest lesson I learned, and I definitely took that into the Ultraman Florida training was that the lever is my best friend for my body, for the way my muscles recover, for my propensity of injury. I needed to put much more emphasis on staying on the lever than having outdoor miles. The importance was just there for me. Yeah. And so before we get into Ultraman training, could you just give us a quick overview of like what Ultraman is? Yeah, absolutely. So Ultraman is not my most favorite thing in the whole wide world, um, <laughs> but it is a three day event. And so day one is a 6.2 mile swim and a 90 mile bike on day two. It's 171.4 mile bike. And on day three is a double marathon for 52.4 miles. Um, and so the way the Ultraman works is you have a crew of two to four people and that crew is your lifeline. They are your fuel. They are, if something goes wrong, they are also your pacers on day three. They're there to spray sunscreen all over you and get you through transition to catch you when you try to get out of the water and you can't stand up. Like they are absolutely your everything. And so you have 12 hours each day to complete each day and if you don't meet the cutoff then you don't finish but part of what makes ultraman unique is that they hope and invite you back for the next day like you may not have finished and you may not have an official time but the camaraderie in the ohana is that you come back and you keep going it just won't be an official time mm. wow yeah and you know for for most people and Honestly, rightfully so. An Ironman is a huge, an accomplishment. Um, Ultraman is definitely taking it to the next level, having that over three days. And it does seem like the team atmosphere, the crew atmosphere is like a really special moment, especially once you get to that third day, because it, that your crew means almost everything. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the third, I don't, <laughs> I don't think my crew or myself expected me to be moving so fast through any of the disciplines. So I kind of put them through their paces um, and trying to chase me down on the bike course and make sure they could get me my nutrition on time because they're your moving aid station. Um, and then on run day, I think my husband ended up running almost 24 miles broken out throughout the day. And he was just a pack mule. He's carrying my bottles. He's carrying ice. He's carrying my nutrition. Like the overall goal and layout of the race is that you show up every morning and your job is to be the athlete. That's it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about the other things. They're helping you through that. 
Um, and so I, it was a very incredible experience. It's, it really does sound like it. I definitely have a couple of questions. Uh, first, mm -hmm. first one is, so 6.2 miles is a long swim. Yes. Is that, and this is someone that hasn't seen it, an actual Ultraman, is that on a looped course or are you out in open water for 6.2 miles? So um, it depends on which one you do. There's four Ultraman branded races, Arizona, Florida, Canada, and the world championship is in Hawaii. So my the one I did was in Florida and it was a three loop in the shape of a triangle um, and a giant lake. Um, and so, but you don't get out of the water, you just keep going. Um, and so you have a kayaker with you and your kayaker has your nutrition. Um, and it's their job to get you from each buoy. It's their job to do the sighting for you. The idea behind it is you're sighting off your kayaker. You're not sighting ahead of you. Um, so you want someone who can make a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. You don't want to have to, you don't want to be swimming tangents by any means when you already have to go 6.2 miles that, that could add a lot. Um, and, and being a runner myself, that swim course does scare me significantly. So, um, no, it's very impressive though. And, and you were in the water for, what was it about? Three, three? 25, I think. Okay. Like three hours and I was the first female out of the water, which absolutely shocked me. Um, my swim is where I have felt like I have always needed to make the most progress and work the hardest at. So I came out of the water and I'm in transition asking my crew, like, how far back am I? Who's ahead of me? And they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, <laughs> that was slower than we expected. So how far back am I? And they're like, no, you're first. And I just like, that still boggles my mind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just shows a testament to all the hard work really paying off, which is which is really cool. Um, and also, just to maybe get the cat out of the bag, you got second place in your first Ultraman. And what surprised me the most about it was you were within four minutes of the first place female. Yeah, um, I really thought day three was going to be a blow me out of the water situation. Um, I don't know for sure, but I think it might be the closest female finish they've ever had. Um, for the person that I got second to has um, world records in ultra running. So to only lose a handful of minutes to her over the run was like over the moon excitement for me. Yeah. And so, I mean, you finished at 25 hours and 37 minutes. First place was 25 hours and 33 minutes. So, I mean, that's, did you know she was right there? Did you know she was four minutes ahead? I, <laughs> the run got very intense. Um, so I don't like to know what mile I'm at whenever I'm racing. I don't like to know how far I've gone. I don't know how far I have left. So the only thing I would check was the minutes I had to the next hour that, so I checked my nutrition and my heart rate. That's all I was looking at. So all I can do is guesstimate where I was when I was getting information from people. And, um, to explain the run course you run and you have to stop. If the stop lights are red, you have to wait for the crosswalk. Um, and it, they take you out to some of the well-known, uh, clay loops for in Florida, Claremont, Florida is where the race is held and they have clay dirt loops that um, they do a lot of races on, which it hadn't rained. So they were very sandy. Um, so it was like running on a beach. And so I'm on the second clay loop. And my husband says to me, he goes, I'm not going to tell you how far she is, but I'm going to tell you it's possible. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy cow, like really? And so like, I got really excited, but I also knew like, I'm only on the second loop, like clay loop. Like I have so far to go and I don't know what my ability will be. Um, and so a friend of mine, we signed up and registered together. And so on run day, we were together. Um, and she heard that and I told her, I was like, we're going to do this. We're going to get there. And um, 
for the next several miles, we were, we would get to a hill and I'd just still be running. And she's like, Katie, we're supposed to walk. And I'm like, oh crap. Cause like in my head, I'm like, I'm going for this. I'm going to like get there. And so, um, I want to say it was like maybe 5k out. My crew told me they're like, you can't stop. You have to run with everything you have. Um, like you have, she's there, like, she's not far up the road. Like they were getting feedback from other people, from my coach, like she's got to keep pushing. Um, and I got like maybe a mile away and they're like, she's just a few stop signs ahead. I'm like, oh my goodness. And so like, I'm sprinting. I end up leaving my husband behind me. Like I took off and, um, yeah, my fa- my last mile was my fastest mile. And I think it was like a seven something at the end of 52 miles. Yeah. Like I was running for everything I had. Um, so I knew she was there. And so it was, it was hard to like, it's hard not to look back and be like, I could have made up four minutes in so many places over the course of 25 hours. At the same time, I am so proud of the consistency of what I executed and going into run day my biggest goal was that I would choose my pace not be relegated to a pace Mm. and that's the race I executed and I can't change that and I'm proud of it yeah no you should be it's an incredible performance incredible day what is what's the fatigue level like on that third day like are you starting feeling fresh at all or are you just like why did i do this race so after day two i got off the bike and we get food in me and i get back and i had to go get something out of the van and my core was so sore i was like oh my goodness every step hurts and i was like let me just take a few jog steps and see how this feels and everything hurt and it wasn't even day three yet and i'm like oh my goodness what have I done to myself? How am I going to wake up tomorrow and do this? And so at the start line, we made the decision. My friend and I, Kenna, she and I were like, we're going to walk the first three minutes, let everyone get their adrenaline out, let them go too hard. We're just going to walk and try and get a little warmed up before we start doing anything. But everything hurt. If you had asked me the night before if I was going to run that well, I would have laughed at you. Um, it was, yeah, it all hurt. <laughs> well, and just to talk about how well you ran. So you negative split the marathons. Yes. So I don't have a, I don't have the numbers right in front of me right now, but I think you said something like 427 and then 415. Is that right? Is that close? 417, Four I think. Yeah, um, I did. And that was another big goal was not to go out too hard and, Like I mentioned, you have to stop at all the stoplights and um, if they're red and I made a very critical error and I think my crew and I also didn't understand the rule that if the street light was green, but the crosswalk was red, I could still run. And we were under the impression that the crosswalk had to be green as well. And so there was a lot of times that I was standing and pacing and circling, waiting for it to turn green. And so I caught almost every red light on the way back. So I didn't think I would negative split. I had no idea. So I wish I knew the real numbers without all those stops, but yeah, I definitely impressed myself. (laughs) Absolutely. So again, so 425, 427, first marathon, second marathon, 417. Um, And I'd love to get into the training then because your Kona split was a, the, a 421 for the Ironman portion of, I'm uh, sorry, for the marathon portion of Ironman Kona, um, which I think anybody looking at that would be like, how is that even possible? Right? Like, how, how do you run a 421? Um, but anyway, I'd love to just dive into the training of like how you built yourself to be so resilient from Kona to Ultraman. So I have to credit all of that to my coach. Um, I don't want to say I didn't trust the process because I saw my friend start training with him in July and knew what he was doing, but it's hard not to. I kept telling him, I want to be the exception. I want to be the person who gets to do more. Um, But 
it was definitely raining it in going into co- uh, training with him. And um, so just for numbers, um, in November, I only ran 41 miles. Um, that probably is the lowest number of miles I've put in since I had surgery. Um, but I walked 22 hours. Um, and then in December, I ran 64 miles. All of these miles were on the lever. Um, so when I talk about those, I'll differentiate, but that was all in the lever. But then in December, I walked 34 and a half hours and my longest walk was six and a half hours. Um, and so it was all about time on your feet. It was all about building the muscle contractions. Um, no matter how that looked, whether it was walking or whether it was with running, um, if I couldn't be on my feet for that long, how was I going to run that long? Um, and so then in January, I finally got to run outside. <laughs> um, I had 89 total miles, uh, 41 of those being outside, but the majority of everything I did was on the lever. And I walked a total of 27 hours in January. Um, and walking is zone one. Walking is aerobic base. Walking is relatively easy. Um, I, there's pictures of my husband next to me while I'm walking and it looks like he's running because I walk 13 minute miles or faster up these hills and he's like trying to run with me to keep up with me in Florida. And so um, my training was all zone one. It was all working on getting me recovered while also allowing my body to have some preparedness for spending that much time doing those tasks of swimming, biking, and running. Yeah. And I think you really bring up an interesting point and obviously you pivoted with your coach pretty well, but you know, one of the reasons why we don't recommend running all your mileage on levers, cause you still do need to get that, the outdoor pounding in. And it seems like you and your coach were very strategic with how you did it by just adding up so much volume by walking and kind of getting still that, that load and the stress that your body still needed to get in, in order like to get ready for the race. Yeah. I think that's why the lever has worked so well for me. Um, I walked my dog for 12 years, like every day. We never missed a day. If I was home, if it was raining, we never missed a day. It was at least two and a half to three miles a day. Um, when I was in college, there were days that I took her up to 12, 15 miles. Like we just, we would just go. And so, um, I think that's why going into both Ironman Texas, it, it worked for me to be on the lever because I was walking the dogs. I was getting that outside slight pounding time on your feet, muscle contractions, but I didn't need the aggressive pounding that running is. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, as we're getting kind of close, closer to wrapping up here, I would love for you to share, like if anybody has interest in like an Ultraman and they're listening to this podcast, they're super inspired by, you know, what you just did, like, do you have any like takeaways, any training tips, like anything that somebody could, you know, if they haven't made that commitment to you know, training for an Ultraman yet, like lessons learned, anything like that, it'd be great for you to share. Yeah. So I think as far as training goes, and I think this goes for any um, distance that you're training, if you think you're taking your easy days easy, you're not taking them easy enough. Um and so much can be gained from taking it that much easier. Um, and I also think that if you're thinking about signing up for an Ultraman in the distance intimidates you um, or the quantity of training, I feel like that's a big turnoff for people. They look at that distance and they think, how am I ever going to fit that much training in? Look back at what you've done for Ironmans. Look back at the amount of time you've spent doing that. and it's not, shouldn't it be double or triple that? Um, You're just going to spend a lot more time at lower intensity. You're not going to be twice as tired. If you're getting twice as tired, you're approaching it wrong. Um, And I think that's the best thing you can do and finding ways to hack the system where you do use the lever so you're not too tired and you do use walking as a way to 
you uh, achieve um, time on your feet. I don't think Ultraman is unattainable for anyone. If you are dedicated and you have a couple of years of just consistent training under your belt, because when it comes down to it, and I look back, I relied so heavily on years of consistent training to allow me to get to the finish line. And that's what it takes. Yeah. And I think those are extremely good points to take away. And one of the big things that we're really, our goal for this podcast is around is like building sustainable athletes and, you know, athletes that can you know, weather the storms that come in life and really set themselves up to be a healthy, fit and competitive athlete for their entire life and not just for a brief season. And so I think a lot of what you just mentioned there around your lessons learned and what you'd recommend other people doing is absolutely spot on and um, love to hear it. So, uh, so real quick before we end, like what's next for you and uh, what's the best way for people to, to follow along with what you're doing? Um, I'm hopefully taking on a 72 hour run race in New Jersey in October. Um, it's a one mile loop, so it's going to be interesting. Um, <laughs> I think that's a form of torture in itself, but, um, we will see how that goes. Uh, the best way to follow me is Instagram. Um, it's try underscore cat T R I underscore K A T 23. Um, and yeah, I hope that people get as much from this as they can. And I hope that it does inspire people to do Ultraman because the community that you gain and the family that you gain from those that have already competed and come out and volunteer their time and our crew and our staff is something you don't get from any other race that I've experienced. Yeah. No, it sounds really special. Uh, I hope the people that are, are interested in it after listening to this, uh, if you check it out and give it a shot. So, but yeah, Katie, thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about incorporating the lever system into your training, follow us on Instagram at lever movement, or even follow me on Strava to learn how I incorporate lever into my training for ultras. Until next time, keep running.